Hi, welcome to Questions of Life. I'm Kath, and I'm here with Donald. Hi. This evening we are looking at the Bible. People have lots of different ideas and opinions about it, and we want to explore what it is and how we can begin to read it. So Donald, we're talking about the Bible, and I think the Bible is perhaps one of the most misunderstood and misquoted books of all time. I think there's a section of society that is just not interested, completely written it off, it's boring, it's outdated, we've changed our morals, we've changed our ethics, don't really need that today. So they're not interested in things, it's a historical document, boring, nothing to say into our lives. But then there seems to be a, another section of society that actually love it, that, that can't get enough of it and think it's the best book ever. So people have it in different formats. Some people have it just as a normal book like this. Some people listen to it, and some people have it on an app on their phones. Uh, but it's interesting that more and more people are reading their Bibles. And I thought it would be really interesting to do a little quiz with you to begin with on oh, the Bible. No. Uh, now, you're dreading this, which is fantastic. Just a few questions to, to give us an idea of just how popular the Bible is. So your first question, you can play along at home. You can have a little guess as well. Your first question is this. How many Bibles are estimated to be in print at the moment? So how many Bibles have been printed, do you think, in the world? See, I'm useless at these things. I, 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 would, I even struggle to tell you the num number of books in the Bible because they are, I'm never good at remembering those kind of things. There's, what is there, four billion people in the world, six yep. billion people in the world, so let's go for a billion. Okay, the answer is six billion. Six billion. Six billion. It's actually in the Guinness Book of Records. So if the Bible was in the, you know, you have the weekly bestseller lists. If it was in that in every country, it would uh, win that every week. So now everybody thinks I'm shockingly uh, no. ignorant and... No, 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 no. You're very intelligent. I'm just <laughs> asking you difficult questions. Okay. How many Bibles are, are sold or given away each year around the world? So there's six billion out there... <laughs> Uh, let's go for let's go for ten million. Okay, it's over a hundred million, which is it's just mind blowing, which isn't is, it? You think of this book, is. everyone's like mm, not interested in it. Around the world, millions of them. Okay, your next question. There is a, a version of the Bible that you can get on your phone. It's called U version. Uh, and so you can read the Bible. You can read it in lots of different translations. You can read it in lots of different languages. Now, how many people do you think have downloaded that app onto their phone around the world? Their phone or their computer? Uh, okay, that, that's got to be sort of smaller. So that's got to be 100 million. Okay, over, this is what they say, over 425 million uh, individual devices, wow. unique devices, have downloaded that app around the world. Okay, your last question. You're doing well. It's great. You're, you're, not, you're not embarrassing yourself at all. Yeah, How many right. countries around our world uh, ban the Bible? Right. Uh, I, you see, I know that I should know this, and I know that people in the church are horrified that I don't know this. So uh, let's, go for, let's go for 10. Okay, it's in the region of about 52. Crikey. So some of those countries will say outright you cannot have it and some of them will say we really frown upon it. And for me, this brings us on to the whole nub of the Bible because I'm fascinated by people in those countries that have banned it. There is something to them that is so precious, so exciting, so life-giving about the Bible that they are prepared to do anything to get one. So they're prepared to be imprisoned, they're prepared to be beaten. Some people are killed for having a Bible. Tell me, why do you think it is? Why is there just this desire amongst people? I've got to have the Bible. It is that precious to them. Where does that come from? I think fundamentally it comes from the fact that we believe it's God's word. I think that when you read the Bible, there are times when you have a profound experience. I call it the hairs on the back of your neck moment where you get goosebumps, where you, you get sense of electricity or people experience in different ways and you think my word these words are for me at this moment and they bring strength or they bring comfort or they bring wisdom 
uh, or, or just a sense of God speaking that ordinary words or literature can't do. Uh, and, and so it's that profound experience that isn't necessarily what people experience every day because the second level is just being guided and just learning wisdom for life. So I think there are two huge aspects of the Bible. The foundational principle which is there every day is just to guide us in life and to learn and understand how to live life, what matters and what God thinks about us and how that changes us. And then there are these moments where it's life changing, where it's, it's, it's profound and it's, uh, and it's strengthening. Um, and we won't have those every day, but I would say for me, and, and part because I teach the Bible, that's my job, uh, I would get those every week. Moments where you think, that's fantastic. That is just speaking to me now. Just hits the spot. Yeah. So it's unlike any other book that we have. Yeah. And we're saying that this is a book that is from God. So it's not like an ordinary book. So an ordinary book, you'd start at the beginning, you'd work your way through it. It's more like a library. So there's 66 different books. 66, thank you. Written over a period. <laughs> I always have 67 in my mind. No, 66. It's two, <laughs> is that two fat ladies or is that 88? Anyway. That's 88. 88. So 66 books written over a period of uh, just over 1,000 years, written in three different continents, mm. and uh, written in three different languages, written by 40 different people. So that's a lot of time, that's a lot of places, that's a lot of people. Uh, and these people had different backgrounds. You had kings, fishermen, you had peasants, you had a whole host of people. What? <laughs> Explain to me, why, why is this book so profound and, and so amazing? Surely it's just the musings of a random selection of, of people. These are just ordinary people that have written books. How, how, how does God make it different to any other book? I think... Uh I, I think that the, it's, it's, it's different because it's an anthology. It's not one person's vision, one person's mm. idea. And that, for me, it, ha, it has a more authentic ring about it. That if I was God and I wanted to communicate with mankind, I would not just take one person. Uh, I would tr take the diversity of humanity that I've created and I would speak through them over different periods of time. So each different book of the Bible has the language and the values of the person that's writing mixed in with the, uh, the things that God wants to say. So God, I think this is the way God uses you and I now. He takes who we are and blends that with what he wants to achieve. And that's what you get in the Bible. So the fact that it's different writers over that period of time, to me, makes it more credible. Mm -hmm. The fact that there's a unity, there are uh, things that are prophesied that are then fulfilled that couldn't be fulfilled even by knowing the prophecy. And clearly the people didn't know the prophecy, but they were beyond their control to fulfill them. There is the fact that the, uh, th there are... Uh, the, 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 the Bible talks about two uh, groups of people. It talks about the Jewish race and it talks about Christians. And at the beginning of the, the new, at the end of the Old Testament, they're, they're very often the same people, but they diverge. Those people groups survive now, hmm. despite persecution, as you've just been saying. And the Jewish people have been persecuted hugely hmm. throughout history, shamefully persecuted. And yet, no other people group of their size, because they're quite a small people group in the Bible, uh, still exists. There are no Philistines around or Hittites or Midianites or all of these different <laughs> people that are there. And, and so there's some sense of saying, well, what, how did these people survive? How has Christianity survived? And we talked about that before. Mm. The, the Bible is, is, to me, made authentic because it talks about Jesus, and we've talked about that before. Perhaps we, you can look at our previous questions of life, and we talked about who is Jesus. So there are lots of things that point to the Bible as being a significant. The fact that it's not been able to be destroyed, that you're saying, you know, all these nations are trying to wipe it out, and yet there are still people in those nations wanting to read mm -hmm. it, being risking in prison 
having it. It's a bit, it reminds me of, uh, you know, in countries that have been d denied uh, democracy, that when they first get a vote, you know, South Africa or whatever, the black, uh, the black community, they all want to vote because it's so significant. And we perhaps take the Bible for granted, but for those for whom it's denied, mm. it's so significant. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to um, explore and understand it because it's transcended generations for, for 2,000 years and mm. nobody can stamp it out. Nobody can get rid of it. Nobody can discredit it. Mm. So it's the word of God. It's inspired by God. Uh, it says that all scripture is given by God, is inspired by God, is useful for teaching and doing lots of other things. So when it was first given and it was first spoken and, and written, there was a power and an authority with it. Mm -hmm. Did the words of the Bible still have that same power and authority today? Was that just for those people then? Or did the promises, the commands, everything in it, does that transcend time and today are just as able to... Absolutely. Ab just absolutely. I, I there are, there are millions of people around the world who are basing their life on scripture and it hasn't let them down. And, and that would be my story. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, every week for the last um, 35 years, I've been studying the Bible, explaining it to people, answering mm -hmm. questions about it, trying to teach it, and it's never, ever let me down. Mm -hmm. And um, it is alive today. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably what we wanted to explore is how we mm -hmm. understand that, how we can apply mm -hmm. that and how we can discover that for ourselves mm -hmm. because absolutely it's relevant mm -hmm. for today. Just before we get into the, uh, the specifics of that, just another question. So we had all of these people all of these years ago, they had this message from God. How do we know that that message is the same message that I have in my Bible today? Because we're in some instances thousands of years beyond that. Uh, within which it was given, and yeah. you, you've played Chinese whispers. You know, you, you, you whisper something and you go around in a circle, and by the time it gets to the person, they, they say it back to you. Yeah. It's been embellished and changed a bit. Yeah. How, how do we know that this is exactly what was intended? Uh, there's, there's two or three really significant reasons that we're, we're very confident that the Bible is accurate to what was intended when it was written. The first is that we have loads of loads of different copies and versions from over the centuries. So uh, they go back uh, quite a long way. So we can see that in the last 1500 years have been very, that there aren't changes. We can see all of that. When it comes to the Old Testament, I don't know if folks have heard of something called the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are really significant. Because uh, in the late 1940s, a, a little boy was playing and uh, he was throwing stones up to a cave that was halfway up a cliff and he heard pottery smashing in the cave so he climbed up and he found um, a load of scrolls he was near the Dead Sea so it was called the Dead Sea <laughs> Scrolls and what he discovered was the writings of a community from shortly before the time of Jesus and uh, he found various copies of most of the Old Testament and some co quite a few copies of some books of the, of the Old Testament and these versions were carbon dated and whatever, and when they worked out that they were around about 900 to 1,000 years older than the previous oldest versions of the Old Testament that they had. Yeah. So they were able to say, okay, we can look at 1,000 years mm -hmm. of people copying and writing it out again. Mm. And remember that in their culture, it would have, they felt that they would be punished fraternally by God if they changed his word. So they could now test this. Mm. And what they discovered is that the Dead Sea Scrolls are remarkably uh, uh, similar. I think they found in thousands and thousands of words, I think they found 13 or 14 where a letter was missed out and nothing was changed in the meaning, but you could see that a, a, a small thing had changed. So you can work out that given the content and the vast number of books that we're mm. talking about, that was showed that the, the, the copying was really accurate. Mm. That's the first big, well, that's the second big thing. So we've got lots of New Testament versions yep. that go right back to very near when they were written. Yep. Um, and we've got the Old Testament checked out by the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the third thing to say is that, and particularly this applies to the New Testament, 
that the, and I think we talked about this before, the New Testament describes the early church leaders in, uh, as being not very clever and, and not very spiritual. Peter particularly, who went on to lead the church. So we know that if they were going to change it, they would have taken out the things that were embarrassing to them, and they didn't. Mm. So we're very confident that the Bible is what was intended. And what happened, just to put the, the New Testament together, was that there are different... Uh, the, the New Testament was a set of letters that was being written by the apostles, uh, Paul or Matthew or Mark or Peter or John, that were circulated around the churches. And after a few years, um, the different communities came together and said, we want to just define what is God's word and what isn't, uh, what is just good advice. And I like the idea that they did that with a whole group of people. Mm. So what's in the Bible isn't one person's decision. It wasn't Peter, it mm. wasn't Paul, it, it wasn't John. It was a group of people coming mm. together and what they all agreed on became the New Testament. And where there were books that they said, well, we think this is good, but over there they don't, then that was left to one side. Now, we still have those books. You, they're in the Apocrypha. You can look at them. There's the Gospel of Thomas and Shepherd and so on. You can look at those books, and they mm. may have lots of wisdom. But there wasn't a unanimous consensus that this was for the Bible. And I, I like that idea that the Bible has come together through God bringing different perspectives. It, it sort of fits the whole idea that it's different mm. writers that it's different people's perspective. It's not one person saying, I'm telling mm. you what it is, and that's what it mm. is. If folks want to check that out, that was the Council of Carthage. Count, thank the you. The Council of Carthage. Right, just a couple of quick questions. Thank yeah. you so much for your questions that are coming in. Um, Kath says, uh, why do hotels have Bibles in bedside drawers? Um, that is due to an organisation called the Gideons, who are a fantastic Christian organisation, who... Uh, encourage, who believe that, a, that the Bible is really relevant for everybody and they believe that a hotel is a place where sometimes people are very low and lonely and that the comfort that the Bible would bring. Mm -hmm. And so they enable and encourage Christian businessmen to fund the giving out of Gideon Bible. So they'll be in a hotel. It, most school kids will get one at some point in secondary school, certainly used to. I, I did when yeah, I was I did as years well. ago. A little, yeah. little purple yeah. thing. And uh, I haven't got it with me, but uh, also footballers get one. And do I have, they? Uh, yes, they do. Why would you have one? You're not a footballer. Because, uh, I, am a, because <laughs> I have got a Cambridge, personalised Cambridge United Gideon Bible. Really? Yes, because the, I happen to know the businessman who paid for the, and gave them out to the Cambridge United players, and he saved one for me. He blessed and you with one. sent it to me. Oh, so I have the that's cute. same, I have a, it says Cambridge United Football Club, Gideon Bible. Oh, does that take away the blessing? Because it's got that on the front. No, it makes it added, it adds, it adds to, to it. the blessing. Yeah. Fabulous, I didn't know that. And the good thing about Gideon Bibles is that they have at the front or the back, a, if front. you're feeling low, if you're feeling worried, if you're feeling um, alone, alone, and yeah. it shows you a passage to read, and that's really, really helpful. Yeah, I think they're brilliant. Yeah, we love the Gideons. Okay, Claire would like to know why the Bible sometimes contradicts itself. Right, um, <laughs> there are lots of places where people think the Bible contradicts itself, yep. and there are. Um, uh, you'd have to get, we'd have to go through there's a few when I say lots there's a few of the ones that are famous I've preached on most of them um, uh, and there are different ex different reasons the first thing is that most of the time the, 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 the gospels are the uh, witness accounts of the different writers and if you go to a, a court of law and you hear three witnesses and they say word for word what somebody says, you, so you begin to imagine that they have collaborated. Yeah. What you get from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is that they will describe things in different ways. that aren't necessarily contradictions, they just describe things in different ways. They will, some of them will have a longer sentence from Jesus and add something that another one doesn't say. That's not a contradiction, mm. it's just a different way of, of, of remembering it. 
uh, often it's because they want to emphasize a particular aspect. So the different writers are, they're not telling us everything that Jesus ever did. They're telling us what they want us to know. And each of the four writers were probably aware of the other gospels. Yeah. So they are telling us perhaps a particular emphasis uh, and a particular uh, um, explanation that they feel the others haven't done. Not because they thought the others were wrong, because they were explaining things to different people. If you go home and you tell a story, you tell it, your story to your neighbour, you tell a story to your mum, you tell a story uh, to your best friend, you might draw out different points of the story because of the person that's listening to it. And the gospel writers do that. They also... Uh, some of the gospel writers tend to say, uh, and the next thing, and so they, they'll tell a story in chronological order, mm -hmm. whereas others of the gospel writers will put together stories that have a similar theme. Mm -hmm. So you could say, well, there's a contradiction because um, there's one that, that I just recently looked at in John's gospel where John has the cleansing of the temple at the beginning and the other writers have it at the end. It's probably because John wanted to emphasise it as, a, as an important story to define who Jesus was. He's not saying the date it happened, he just tells it earlier in his story. Uh, we, we're used to books and, and biographies that go use flashbacks and all of that. Mm -hmm. So there's some element of that. Sometimes there, in, in, uh, there are things that are uh, different emphasis. So the way I like to explain it is this. Um, imagine that you are supporting a person who has a, a, a critical exam, and maybe an ex exam at work or an A-level or something like that, or an O-level, something like G GCSE, something like that. They've got a major exam and you're supporting them. And suppose they come to you and they say, should I revise tonight? And suppose that they have done absolutely no work for the last three months and the exam is tomorrow morning. I guess your advice to them would be, uh, you need to spend all night revising because <laughs> you've done nothing. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. <laughs> If they come to you and they say, should I revise tonight? Mm -hmm. And they have actually worked really hard for the last three months. You might say, no, you've done enough. Go and have a good night's sleep and relax. Mm -hmm. The point is that you give different advice because of the different contexts and the different uh, situations that you're speaking to. It's the same question, should I revise, but two people in different situations. Mm -hmm. Very simply put, the Bible gives different advice to the arrogant as it does to the humble. Yeah. So it says to the arrogant, you need to be really careful what you're doing. If you think you can treat people, bully people, uh, push people around and think God doesn't notice, you need to be mm. very, really aware and possibly frightened because mm. God does not allow you to treat people badly. Yeah. If a person is coming and saying, look, I've messed up my life and I'm a failure and I'm useless. The Bible has a very different message, which is God forgives you and you're loved and you're valued. Mm. And those can appear to be contradictory messages, but it's actually about the context. Yeah. So to those who say, God, I've messed up, he says, you're forgiven. To those who say, I've done nothing wrong, everything is everybody else's fault. And we've talked a lot about this over mm -hmm. the time then there's a message of be, well, be, be very aware that God will judge you. Yeah. So we have to understand that sometimes it's not a contradiction, it's a different emphasis, it's a different mm -hmm. tone. Mm -hmm. It's a way of describing something differently. It's a way of ordering events differently. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, uh, there are times when Jesus takes something from the Old Testament and takes it further. So... Um, I'm probably going on too long, but, no, keep, but, keep but the, 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 the most famous one is that in the Old Testament law, it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yep. Now that was the law that applied to the nation. That was the way the government was to act. Mm -hmm. uh, if you damage somebody's eye, then the criminal punishment for you was that you would lose an eye. Now that sounds barbaric and harsh, but we go back to what we looked at in previous weeks. The context was that the other laws of the land of other nations were saying, if you take somebody's eye out, you kill them. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And human nature is that if you are hurt, you retaliate with more force. So actually the way the Old Testament law was written was not saying you need to take somebody's eye out. It was mm-hmm. saying you can do no more than what they've done to you. There has to be a limit in law and the punishment fits the crime. It can't be an escalation of the crime. Yep. Now that's really significant because then when Jesus is talking, he's not talking about the law of the land. He is talking about the way we treat each other. Mm -hmm. And he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I tell you, if someone hits you on on your cheek, turn the other cheek. And he's taking the principle from the Old Testament law, which was not retaliating and was applied to the state. He then applies that to the individual and says, we take the same principle of we don't escalate, we don't retaliate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in the way you treat people, you forgive them. Mm. So that is a good example of, mm. you say one thing to a state, which is that there must be justice. You say no, one thing to an individual, which is that there needs to be retaliation. So that's why there's a different context. Mm. But also there's a journey of Jesus building on it. Mm-hmm. So it's not a contradiction, mm-hmm. it's a development.